you so much for coming. My name is Cece Harris, and I have the joy and privilege of serving as the president of the board for the Friends of the MSU Library. As an alumna of MSU, I've been personally impacted by the resources and programs that the Friends of the Library puts on, and thank you all for attending just such one of those events. So we are in for a fun, enjoyable, and educational night tonight. Thank you, Martha. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Friends of Montana State University Library, we are a group dedicated to enriching the lives of students and community by strengthening the library itself. Since our foundation in 1994, we have been instrumental in helping maintain the library's role in research and public service on campus, as well as uh, throughout the state of Montana. If you're not a friend of the library, we do have some information at the registration table about how to do that. And I love a former board member of ours quote, while nobody at MSU graduates from the library, certainly nobody graduates without it. So thank you for joining us this evening. With that, I'd like to introduce the Dean of the Library, Mr. Kenny Arledge. exceeds 147,000 square miles and includes 55 state parks, numerous wildlife management areas, historic sites, cultural landmarks, fish hatcheries, scientific laboratories, and the Montana Wild Interpretive Center and Museum in Helena. As the Missoulian put it in an article last year, visiting all seven regional headquarters of the FWP can easily put 3,000 miles on the odometer. It's a big, big area. Martha is the first woman and possibly the first attorney appointed to this position. Me. <laughs> and although she assumed the directorship in early 2017, she had previously served the FWP as its legal counsel from 1998 to 2011. She's currently on leave from a faculty position in the University of Montana School of Law, where she taught natural resource law public land and resources law, and wildlife law. We are delighted that Martha accepted a bobcat invitation to speak at the MSU Library's annual trout lecture. While she clearly has a broad portfolio in her job, the appropriate title of her presentation tonight is Wild Trout in Montana. She will be happy to answer questions afterward. Please welcome Martha Williams. that I wasn't supposed to talk about elk in big game. <laughs> I'm so used to that. 
Actually, I thought I'm, I'm very honored to be here and to be invited to talk about walleye and sauger. They're my favorite topics. <laughs> That's meant to be a joke, but only half a joke. Actually, the fact that I can tease about that is in part due to Dick Vincent's legacy and the lessons we learned from wild trout and are able to apply them to other species. So thank you for that. So good evening, and thank you to the Montana State University Library for having me. I'm honored that you would invite an admitted non-scientist to speak to you, because I've ironically spent my entire career trying to translate science to decision makers and judges. So I'm curious more about you than I am about myself at the moment, and I thought I'd, I'd start off with asking you a few questions just to get to know the audience and what you might be interested in. Uh, how many of you are students? Great, thank you. Because you are the future of conservation. You are the leaders of not too soon tomorrow. So thank you for being here. How many of you in the audience are scientists or biologists by trade? Thank you. You're the underpinning of what we do, and we couldn't do it without you. How many of you think of yourselves as um, relationship people? You're interested in how the people and um, cultures and communities fit together with our natural resources. Right, so they're not mutually exclusive, I hope. <laughs> how many of you think, how many of you think you know what Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does? How many of you think you know all that Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does? <laughs> so I've been on a quest for the past year. I've been the director for only a year. So uh, pretty new, still very exciting. I pinch myself most days. I also summon my inner courage most days to show up at work. But I'm on a quest to get around the state. To I have been to all of the regions. I will go as often as I can. But I'm on a quest to try to understand all that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does. And I would guess, I don't know that anybody any one person realizes the breadth of what Fish, Wildlife, and Parks covers. And I want to use tonight to talk about that a little bit more, to get in the habit of telling our story, and for people to understand the breadth of what we're doing, and then dive into the specific issues of wild trout management specifically, but our fisheries management. Just um, when I taught at the law school, one of, I don't know, none of my students are here for me to pick on. I do have a habit of picking on them, so I guess they're lucky they're not here. One of the things that I really stressed to my students was understanding context and place. And in Montana, I, don't, I think that's especially important, that all of our work requires that we understand the place where we are and that we have some context on how the issues might evolve in the specific place. So um, with that, I just think it's important to give some context tonight about the breadth of what Fish, Wildlife, and Parks covers. I'm going to do a quick video We tried this ahead of time. Um, looks like that may not work. Uh, so the, the video, the gist of the video is at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we understand we need to get better about telling our story. We need to explain context and help people understand the breadth of what we cover and what that means to each of us in Montana and what it means to us as a nation. That it really goes to the integrity of the outside experience in Montana, which is why most of us are here. So what is our mission? It's a mouthful, but I read it 
every morning when I go to my desk. I read it every day to remind me that Montana Fish and Wildlife and Parks, through its employees, through our Citizen Commission, our Fish and Wildlife Commission, our board, our Parks Board, provides for the stewardship of the fish, wildlife, parks, and recreational resources of Montana, while contributing to the quality of life for present and future generations. So fish, wildlife, parks, recreational resources, cultural resources pretty broad and pretty inspiring, not just pretty, incredibly inspiring. This is meant to, to be, make you dizzy. <laughs> and I'll move on from it, it's not an exciting visual, but to remind our constituents that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks means fisheries, the fisheries division, our fisheries resources, our parks resources, our wildlife resources, it includes you know, often the, um, the face of the agency are our enforcement officers, that they put their safety on the line every day, but they also work to include people and um, help educate people. It includes communication and education. Those are lumped together, but they're both pretty big. We have to be better about communicating what we do. And education sometimes feels like an appendage, and it should it's critical to bringing young people into the fold and explaining better what we do. This afternoon, I was lucky enough to talk to some of the ecology graduate students, aquatics, and uh, one of the students very presciently said, gave me the suggestion, I think you need to do a better job educating people. Because once people understand the, the issues, the context and what you do, it's easier to sort through the issues. That doesn't mean it's easy, but it's easier when everyone has that common understanding. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we get our revenue both mostly through licensing. So our licensing division is critical to us operating. Accounting, if you've read the papers in the last year, um, we've been called to the mat on some of our accounting practices and how we track the money we receive and the money we pay out. Our budgeting, um, the health of our budgeting is critical to us having credibility to get our work done. Technology services. How many of you had the joy of um, signing on to my FWP when you were trying to get the hunting licenses for this year? You know, I, I heard about that a lot. That's we're working through that. We have to protect everyone's information, but we also want to provide better service through technology services. Human resources, they do a yeoman's duty um, hiring. We have 722 full-time employees, and that almost doubles with summer seasonal employees. And that takes a lot of work to, to hire them and manage those seasonal employees who are also critical to us fulfilling our mission. Then we have seven regions. So what does that look like? Think of the geographic breadth of our state and that we need to cover it all. It covers mountains. Think of region one, western Montana. It covers rivers. It covers prairies and plains. It covers parks and all those resources. So to remember the geographic vastness of our state and that we cover it all and that they're not the same, it's varied. That it covers game species, non-game species, fisheries, communities, public outreach, enforcement. Those are just examples. So if we were to take the breadth of what Fish, Wildlife, and Parks does and narrow it down to the fisheries division, what does the fisheries division need to do to meet its mission, to be stewards of the fisheries resources across our vast state? So is any of it about water? Right? It's all about water and all the different components of water. So water rights adjudications, critical. Fishing access sites. How many of you have been to a fishing access site? Almost everybody. So I'll talk about those later. I think they are an absolute gem in how incredibly lucky we are to have the fishing access sites we do in our state. 
How many of you use fishing access sites for fishing? How many of you use fishing access sites just for access to the water and maybe not fishing? Right? So we're seeing a change in how our fishing access sites are used. Um, and that we are an agency about access. Um, it's not just hunting access, it's fishing access sites. Fishing access, it's access to our waters and lands for other recreational purposes. So what does that mean if you distill our mission? What is our role then as an agency? And what does it look like when we're fulfilling our mission? Ideally, really our job is to unite people to protect the integrity of the Montana outdoor experience. That's pretty lofty, but I bet every one of you is in this room tonight because you care about that. You know, who doesn't? And how many of us feel that there is a certain exceptionalism? There's something extraordinary in Montana about the experience, the integrity of the experience you have here versus other states. And that's something worth fighting for. It's something worth working for. And that doesn't mean it's easy, and it doesn't mean it has to be, but it's worth it. Um, so I, one of my um, issues, I feel that we would get a lot more work done if we were better, or a little more courageous about understanding our roles and having those conversations in realizing we don't have to agree on everything. But if we understand our roles and how they fit together, we might get a lot more done. So I just met with a young lady as I came in, and she works for an organization that sometimes is at odds with, with I think you could say access, maybe, sometimes with fish, wildlife, and parks. And we talked about, in this age, if we were just better at talking about our roles and having those fierce conversations, we might get a whole lot more done because there are many things we might agree on. And let's just agree on what we can agree on. And we don't have to convince each other that we might agree on everything. But they're those key commonalities. So I think of this all the time now, is how do we unite people to protect the integrity of the Montana experience and outdoors? And so what we've done as an agency, we've taken this, and this was through a lot of public input that we thought of this statement. How do you break that down? What does it mean? So we, we broke it down into four values, four key beliefs that are critical to us, to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks being a healthy agency. Integrity, inclusivity, to be inclusive, to provide balance, and opportunity outside. So tonight I'm going to, I will go through each of those four beliefs or values and give examples through the Fisheries Division of how I think as an agency we are meeting these but we always have work to do, and we can always improve. So what do we mean by focusing on integrity? You know, broadly across the agency, that includes professional and scientific integrity, critical. The integrity of the land, water, and cultural and historic resources we manage and conserve. The integrity of the outdoor experience, whether it's hunting, fishing, trapping, camping, hiking, or boating or others. By maintaining the integrity of all of that, we help keep Montana a place of beauty, wonder, and opportunity. And that's different from other places. I just was talking to somebody as I came in um, this evening. The other day I was um, flying to, unfortunately I don't get out enough anymore. My job means I work with my job and I'm not out fishing and recreating like I used to be, and it means a lot of flying around the country. So I was flying to Norfolk, Virginia, to the North American Conference of Wildlife, Fisheries and Wildlife. And I, as I went to the airport in Helena, there was this big group of people with a ton of bags and, and guns. You could see their gun cases. And I went up to them and I said, what are you doing? Where are you going? It's always that excitement of being at an airport and, and going off on an, an adventure. 
And they said, we're going to South Africa to go hunting. And I thought about it as I got on the plane and you know flew across the country. I thought, you know, the, something resonated with me there and that Montana has become, to some degree, that place in North America where people come here, right, to fish, hunt, recreate in a way they can't somewhere else because of that integrity of the experience they get here. And to pay attention to that, that we can't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. And what does it mean to fish wildlife in parks as the steward of those resources? What is it, what's the responsibility on us to manage those for the long term? So those resources, the corpus, will be around for a long time for people to enjoy. Um, that's, that's pretty cool that we get to think about that. So, integrity. Mr. Vincent, I believe, is in the audience. Would you? Can we? I, I get to pick on Dick Vincent instead of um, my students. <laughs> so, and you are Bobcat. He did go here, right, as an undergraduate student and a graduate student. You're clapping well, you know. I can be generous for the evening. <laughs> so, so, I'm talking about integrity, those four beliefs that are so important to us being a healthy agency and adhering to our mission to be stewards of these remarkable resources and uniting people to protect the integrity of that experience. So an example for tonight is in part Dick's work for fish, wildlife, and parks and beyond. I hear you've moved from trout to dachshunds. I was told to give you that, to, to do that. But um, So why bring up Dick as an example of integrity? So what is what do you, in your mind, what does integrity require? I think it requires some bravery in natural resource management and fisheries management. It requires a strong underpinning of science and data. It requires working with others. It requires a number of items. What am I missing, Dick, on what, you, what integrity entails? Being honest with the sportsman about what you see. I'd say being honest with everyone. I mean, I do. I very strongly feel as an agency, every conversation we have, every conversation that an employee of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has with the public or one another, we w requires honesty. But otherwise, we get ourselves in a world of hurt, and we can't afford to do that. So honesty, and it's not always easy to be honest. Certainly not um, when you have angry sportsmen and women and, and others. So I bring Dick up and wild trout management in Montana as an example of integrity. And I do that because his groundbreaking work, I think, is a model and a metaphor for all that we do at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, not just wild trout management. So it, it, an example, and this is somewhat awkward. I told Dick earlier, I don't know if it's more embarrassing for me to try to, to, to distill Dick's life work <laughs> into this talk or for him to have to hear um, me do it. But what he was presented with, I believe, first I want to back up because this is critical to how we operate as an agency. In 1951, Congress passed the Dingle Johnson or Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration Act. And um, that imposes an excise tax on sport fishing equipment, um, fishing tackle, yachts, pleasure, um, pleasure craft. And that money is used to help state agencies restore, conserve, and manage sport fish in their habitat. What that translates to is it's critical to fisheries research and management. That's what we, we use to fund those efforts. So in the mid-60s, do I have the time frame right? In the mid-60s, as I understand, um, I was around, but I was a little too young to know just what was going on 
Um, Dick Vincent started monitoring trout populations. And at that time, we didn't have really accurate ways to track populations. So, and I believe with the help of your uncle and friends and yourself, developed electroshocking equipment and technologies to try to monitor and understand trout populations. So, in doing that, Dick picked two stretches of the Madison River. How many of you have been on the Madison River? Again, every, it's a pretty, pretty tough crowd. So, Dick picked two stretches of the Madison River, the Norris stretch and the Barney stretch. And first, which is, demonstrates another type of leadership, I would say balance and inclusion, um, worked with a power company to increase flows. Because at that time, you understood that increased flows were critical to the fish populations. So the power company increased these flows, and the not, both stretches of populations did not increase as you thought they might. So wondered, okay, what is the science telling us? What, that doesn't make a lot of sense. What's going on here? So that you looked at where, what was the difference? And the difference was in the Norris stretch, there was no fish stocking. Fish, wildlife, and parks did not stock trout. But in the Barney section, fish, wildlife, and parks did stock trout. So, so there was a difference. So then moving forward, saying, okay, how does this fit together? What next? Um, did a study where they used Odell Creek as a control and stopped Odell Creek. Discontinued stocking the Varney stretch on the Madison River Con and, and kept management of the um, Norris stretch the same, which meant not stocking. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second. What do you think it would feel like as a Fish, Wildlife, and Parks employee, for me even as the director, to say, you know, we're not going to stock fish um, on the Varney stretch of the Madison River anymore? That was huge. And a lot of repercussions, personal and professional, potentially, that required those honest, frank conversations. So a lesson learned, I think, for the students especially, but all of us, when I was talking to the students, what I wish for in future generations, that we were more, um, that we showed humility, and that we were more forgiving of each other, which means you're better able to say, to admit to what you don't know. It's pretty hard sometimes, I think, for people to admit, you know, I don't know that. And here, there was that honesty of saying, we're not sure, but we're going to study this and use science to figure it out and take our licks. And that is a responsibility of fish, wildlife, and parks. We're not always going to be popular, believe you me. But it is our responsibility to think about the long term, to be stewards of these resources to be the long-term stewards of them. That doesn't mean just for today or tomorrow or the next five years. So, took your licks, I suppose, by stopping stocking of um, the Varney stretch. What was it gonna do to us as a community? What was it gonna do to the populations? Well, it turns out it was pretty helpful. So what happened was that the populations started to improve on the Barney stretch, first by 153%. That's pretty darn good. Ultimately, what by 213% at the end of the study. So it was it worth the risk? Was it worth being honest and saying, we don't know, but we want to study this, and it might come to good things? So why I use this as an example for integrity is what resulted this and what we could have take from wild trout management on the Madison River across the state, not just for wild trout, but for sauger walleye, for wildlife populations. And for me, personally, through my career, I have been, and something I love about fish, wildlife, and parks, is that we focus on habitat that we focus on the health of the ecosystem. We're, when we talk about endangered species, when we talk about game animals, 
whatever species we're talking about, we focus on the habitat. We've been really careful over the years to try not just to focus on the species, but the habitat around them. And I think that's something for us to really stick to our guns about in today's political times, where I see a lot more discussions focused on sage-grouse versus sage-grouse habitat, or grizzly bears versus the grizzly bears and um, how they recover and what it means to populations. So, so thank you, Dick, for exhibiting to me integrity, strong scientific underpinning, honesty and bravery in moving forward with what science demonstrated, and really ultimately having people care, understand that the environment for a species is what's important. So wild trout management, now we focus on habitat protection and enhancement, and we still do. At Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, we um, work on habitat protection, permits for stream work, water adjudication, restoration projects. So that work continues today. Habitat, habitat, habitat. And that's not just for fisheries. And the resiliency in the long term, especially, I hope we have a chance to get to talking about challenges that come our way. I think we have some, but um, I think we're in a good spot to address them. So what's the second belief or value that's critical to fish, wildlife, and parks? Being a steward of these resources and protecting the, uniting people to, to protect the integrity of them. Second one's inclusion. Can fish, wildlife, and parks do any of this alone? Not a chance. Not a chance. We can't do really any of our work alone. And if we think we can, we've got something else coming to us. So inclusion, and what does inclusion mean? That we bring people together. So through Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, people discuss, debate. Do people engage in these issues? You bet. Do people get passionate about them? You bet. With the students this afternoon, we were talking about that. It can be hard. Emotions can fly. I've developed a thicker skin than I'd ever want to, but it's a gift. It's a gift that people engage on these issues. So it's not a complaint. At least people care. So we, it is our job to unite people to discuss, debate, pay for, learn about outdoor resources and experiences. We should create solutions, but we can't do that by ourselves. We need even more inclusion. So the example I want to use for inclusion is aquatic invasive species. <laughs> um, everybody knows to clean, drain, and dry their boats, right? Yes? Yes? Thank you. Um, so when invasive mussels, we first thought we had a hit in, of, of invasive mussels in Montana. I had not taken the position as director yet. <laughs> um, I, don't, I wouldn't have second-guessed that for a minute. But it was while Fish, Wildlife, and Parks had a program on aquatic invasive species, it was a shoestring operation. So in a very short period of time, first we stood up an incident command team. Fish, Wildlife, and Parks wasn't used to standing up incident command teams. That wasn't something that we knew how to do. We could not do that alone. It required partnerships. DNRC completely helped us out. We couldn't have done it without DNRC. We couldn't have done it without Department of Environmental Quality. We couldn't have done it without Department of Transportation. We couldn't have done it, for example, we got help from the um, Red Lodge firefighters. We couldn't have stood up that first incident command team without extraordinary help from our partners and admitting that we needed their help to get on it right away. And then because of the strength of those partnerships, in a very tight budget session, legislative session, we got the funding for an aquatic invasive species program. That's incredible. Somehow, by pulling together and having that 
extraordinary partnership. We got the support of legislators who don't support a whole lot of what we do, but they did support that. And then the next step from there, be, uh, go moving from an incident command team into full-on implementation, we could not have, what does it require? It requires inspection stations, decontamination, and education. We have the tribes helping us with inspection stations. We couldn't do it without the tribes' help. Conservation districts have stepped up and helped us in a way that we've never partnered with them before. Local governments, NGOs have been incredibly supportive. So it's this new partnership model that we've never, we've never needed quite to the degree that we have with aquatic invasive species. And I, I thank everyone for the support we've gotten to get this up and running. I would not be honest if I didn't say there we're learning and that we're, we're learning as we go. So I'm not pretending that we know it all in aquatic invasive species and that we have it all figured out. We're learning from other states, we're learning from tribes, we're learning, learning from provinces, and I'm, I'm proud of our staff and that they're admitting where we might do better. So an example of the requirement that we, of inclusion and bringing people together, we've known Tiber Reservoir was where there was a positive hit. Well, have, how many of you been to Tiber Reservoir? Pretty remote, big area. How do you have, how do you have inspection stations and cover all of Tiber Reservoir? It's a challenge. And so we were going to limit access points to Tiber Reservoir this spring for this coming season. But we, to be honest, we could have been more inclusive. Did we work with the community enough? Did we talk to the legislators ahead of time? Not enough. So our public meetings demonstrated we needed to be more inclusive with Tiber Reservoir this spring. And we're having more public meetings and we're going to do that and I think we'll come up with a better solution. Will it make everybody happy? No. Can it? No. But will it do a better job? I sure hope so. So that's, I, for me, aquatic invasive species and our approach there, um, our needed partners, is an example of why we need to bring people together. Um, there's also the creation of the UC3, the Upper Columbia um, Commission there which I think broadened the issue beyond just the Flathead Basin, but to the whole Upper Columbia Basin. So what's the third value, the third um, belief? Balance, ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I remember an interview when Brian Kahn interviewed now um, judge, District Court Judge Brian Morris and asked him about activist judges. And Brian said, you know, he asked, what's an activist judge? And Brian said, it depends whose ox is getting bored. I think balance is somewhat the same. You know, what you think is a balance, it all depends on, on where you stand. But as stewards of the public trust, and we are stewards of the public trust, that's an honor. Our job is to create balance through sound science and management. And that, among almost every decision, means weighing the various needs of different user groups, as well as balancing use of the resources themselves. Now, that can get tricky, right? Where if we're supposed to stand up for the resource, is there room for balance? Where do people fit in? Where do com communities fit in? So I, I argue that we do need balance. But that, that balance means constant tending. It wouldn't be a balance if you just did something and it stayed the same, right? It's that constant need to attend to it and adjust and learn. So what's an example of balance? I, I would argue that the um, work in the big hole on Arctic railing is an example of balance. And it's also an example of where place matters, context and place matters. So if we, first of all, life in parks, were to just show up in the big hole valley and ask landowners to help us out, how does that work if you just knock on the door and say, hey, 
I work for the state for Fish and Wildlife and Parks, have our big fish and game truck. Want to help us out? Right? No. It requires tending, relationship building, years. It requires some patience. You don't do it overnight. And it does require balance. And I, there are some discussions. Uh, there's the uh, court case challenging the candidate conservation agreements in the Big Hole Valley. It just was, I know, um, the oral argument was just in the Ninth Circuit Court. I would argue, this is a question, something to think about. While the resource is critical and we want grayling to do better, what would it look like? What would grayling conservation look like if we didn't have these candidate conservation agreements? if we didn't have some of these agreements in place. So are they a panacea? No. Are they important as ways for us to, in this place, in certain places in Montana, to work with long-standing landowners? I would posit yes. What would it look like if they weren't there? If we didn't make some of those hard decisions and work with landowners? So if it's the panacea, no, but what, what has resulted from some hard work and balance and understanding place, improved stream flows, projects in place that we couldn't have done without that balance, I think, improved stream and riparian habitat, fish passage, reduced entrainment. Those are all benefits of that hard work, those relationships built over years, and also understanding our role and knowing sometimes we get a whole lot more done when we're not the ones doing it. Knowing when it's a role for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to be engaged, and when there's a role for another agency or another uh, organization to help out, and for us to step back, because we wouldn't be as helpful. So the last belief uh, and value is that we perpetuate opportunity outside. What we're really talking about with all these resources, including wild trout, is that in the integrity of the experience outside when you're in Montana. And aren't we all about having people engage care about these resources, care about that opportunity. Without people caring about it, how would we get our work done? So to, I think, perpetuating this opportunity outside is all about relevancy going forward and having the support to do our work. People live in and visit Montana for what it offers outside. When Fish, Wildlife, and Parks creates opportunities and passion for Montana experiences, we build public support and cooperation that help us keep Montana, Montana. That's the logic behind what will be our new tagline, the outside is in us all. So the last Fisher's example for opportunity outside for these beliefs are fishing access sites. So I think our fishing access sites are this gem that's kind of flown under the radar. I don't know of another state that has them. We've just built them over time, over 332 fishing access sites across the state. That they connect our state. They, they connect our rivers and people to our rivers. We could not recreate these fishing access sites in this day and age moving forward. It's time, again, that patience of building one site after another, looking where people need access. It's the, our fishing access sites coupled with stream access. That the opportunities we have in Montana, those opportunities outside are part of a lot of hard work, blood, sweat, and tears over the years. Your husband, you, Dick, all these others who worked as champions of stream access. 
to get these fishing access sites in place one at a time to assemble that system. That's pretty special. So, to be hopeful, as I finish, I'm hopeful because of people's engagement. I'm hopeful because of our students. I'm hopeful because people care about these resources. I'm hopeful because if I can do anything in my time as the director at Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, it's to help our agency be a team that works well together so that we can address the challenges that are coming our way. And we know we've got them, but we'll be ready to address them. So I, I have lots more to say, but I will leave it at that because I did want time for questions and answers. That's a way for me to hear what you're, you really want to know <laughs> and any um, questions you might have. It's a good way for me to learn what everyone's thinking. So with that, I turn it over to questions and answers. And if people are too shy, I can talk more, but I'd rather hear from you. Yeah? How does the current pricing structure for out-of-state college students further the mission of what is the current pricing structure for out-of-state college students at MSU or University of Montana? For hunting and fishing licenses. Oh, for hunting and fishing licenses? Right, so why do we charge non-residents more than residents? Um, because those licensing fees fuel how we get our work done. We wouldn't have enforcement officers without those fees. We wouldn't have all of the biologists we have. We wouldn't have wildlife um, biologists, fisheries biologists. We wouldn't have the infrastructure. Now, is the, if your question is not just the differentiation between residents and non-residents, but how much it is, there was a, a lot of... for college students because you're, like, on the last point you made, right, you're looking for inclusion. Yeah. And there's a lot of college students that are not participating. Because of the price. Because of the price. Yep. For those people, if they got into it in college, they may, as they get older, they may become into it and they may contribute. And I believe that that provides greater value than all of those people are free. And that's what I want to see too. So why not have um, more in, uh, inclusive prices for college student, non resident college students to encourage you to participate? Sounds like you should contact a legislator, and I hope we don't show up and oppose that bill, the legislature, <laughs> because we want the money for our operations. No, I, I, and I don't mean to be um, flippant. I, I, it's a good question. I, I, it's always a fine line. I think we need to do the best we can to encourage people to participate, period. So, um, with that said, we need to operate as an agency too, but I we need we need more people involved, and if that's something that would help, it's a good idea. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll, I'll go off that uh, the licensing fee. Um, so there's a bunch of short problems with that in all states, and they're funded mostly by uh, hunting and angling licenses. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in Montana, there's a lot more out of recreation. You have to fund that aquatic species. Mm -hmm. species. So you know, added a aquatic mix species here, which I think is a great thing. But you're going to get some of that state revenue from those non-angles to help fund for those aquatic mix species. So the question is: Is there, you know, we get revenue from hunters and anglers, and we get revenue from sport fish, fish uh, excise taxes on. Um, fishing equipment, and then guns and ammunition, too. Those federal sources that are so important. Uh, could we find an, all, uh, an additional source of revenue that taps into other recreationists, not just hunters and anglers? And, th and that came up when we were talking, when I was talking to the graduate students this afternoon. Uh, you bet we need to be looking at it. There's a bill in, um, Congress right now called Restoring America's Wildlife Act that doesn't have a specific funding source attached to it, but it talks about broadening um, funding sources and, and how to help pay for species restoration, for example, not just game species. So I think a lot of people are looking at that. The trick, I think, is to make sure that hunters and anglers uh, 
feel very included. And um, if you were to broaden the pie, explain why and how, and that you're not living, leaving that traditional base behind. That we're very used to funding our state fish and wildlife agencies through this licensing structure. Um, and so it's a shift and you just have to navigate that carefully to be inclusive and not leave the traditional base behind. So I think a lot of people are looking at that. And then what adds to that um, is in Montana that it's fish, wildlife, and parks, which makes a ton of sense to me as we really are in the recreation business. Whether we like it or not, we're charged with that. Um, whether it's river recreation, water-based recreation, um, hunting, camping, hiking, you know, all of the above. So the challenge of funding state parks where, because you cannot use license money or by and large those federal sources of money to fund parks. So how do we do that going forward? So it's a, it's a good question and a lot of people are looking at it and if you have an answer, I'm all ears. Yes? I think the question would be, on the first question, what does the state that the Montana non-resident student comes from charge their non-resident college students? And let's not forget that many, many states in the Midwest, there are no lessons to be available because they're all on a Because they're all? On a draw. On a draw. Right. So the question is, if, if we really wanted to um, encourage, in a way, non-resident college students, how would you do that? How would you structure it? Do you look at their states, how, what, what the price would be there? And the answer is, in some of those states, they're not even available. It's the, it's the opportunity that we provide that's so extraordinary. I, I, I hear you, but at the same time, I don't think it ever hurts to think about how we can encourage more people to participate. That comes with peril, too. Yes? You uh, are, are suggesting getting more people, and Bozeman is trying to replicate the reason for attracting. Do you sit on any officially on any planning program that would affect a town like Bozeman for the future? Right. Um, the question is, do I, from Fish Wild, as a representative fish, of Fish Wildlife and Parks, sit on any of those planning processes for Bozeman? I do not. But I do know that our um, we have a responsive management unit, and they pay attention to comment. They coordinate all of our, our comments as an agency to any uh, NEPA processes, planning processes. We certainly engage in subdivision processes, things like that. So, so sometimes our regional staff does do that to some degree. But I think we raise another question, and that is, you know, as we want to encourage people to get outside, we want to encourage people to participate. We also, if we think about the challenges ahead, climate, drought, fire, I'd say um, pressures. Pressures on our resources from overuse in some places, or how does that impact the experience? How do we want to do, get into that whole social issue? But Bozeman, I mean, what better place to talk about pressures than here in Bozeman, where you, I, it's growing you know, so much more than, say, in eastern Montana. And, and are we prepared to do that? I mean, I think we're trying to be, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah. In fact, and then. Uh, what is FWP's official stance on what caused the Yellowstone River fish um, So last summer, you know, there was the Yellowstone River fish kill. I don't have a good answer to that. That's not, I mean, is, are any of our biologists here who worked on that? I mean, I think it, we, my understanding was that we thought it was a combination of factors. So it wasn't just one thing. And was, was it there to begin with and was exacerbated by a factor? As a follow up to that, uh, it's, a, it's come out that uh, this is going to trout that as white fish during that's the nature of that. Um, I don't know the numbers. Because the, 
original fish kill was just before I started to, and we had heard about it this summer. Yeah. As my understanding, there was not enough runoff going into the Yellowstone to keep the water cool enough so that this uh, algae or whatever it was that ended up killing it. And Trout Unlimited Montana, uh, through their lawyer, uh, ended up working out with the, all the act users that were using that water to coordinate the drainage into the Yellowstone, and it's helping to solve the problem. So the question is whether you know temperatures and flow, right, are critical pieces of that, and and I would say yes, everywhere they are. And did we have the help of Montana Trout Unlimited and other NGOs? in trying to address that. I wouldn't say solve it, but address it, yes. Um, so, but that's part of our, our ongoing work. But I thought it was not only um, temperature and flows, um, that those changes or pressures exacerbated the fish's, the fish's susceptibility to these diseases. Or, put another way, those are, those are challenges facing us coming down the road the road, whether it's another disease, not just PKD, right? But are there other people in the room? This is where the honest, for me to admit, there are other people in the room who know way more about this than I do. I know enough to be dangerous. I know enough to care about how our agency responds and responds into the future. Um, yes, right here. When I call participation, it, does FWP find that participation in hunting and fishing, particularly among, um, let's say, 20, some, 20, 30 something year olds, is increasing or decreasing? So, across the nation, um, participation hunter numbers are decreasing. Fishing is increasing slightly. You know, there are peaks and valleys. Where we've seen the biggest increase is in women fishing, actually. Um, so, Montana is a little bit of an anomaly. This goes back to thinking about seeing those, um, the people at the Helena Airport going to South Africa to go hunting. We, Montana, is not seeing the dip in license sales and the decrease in participation that some of others, most other states are seeing. But there's constant challenge to make sure we engage 20-somethings 15, so, you know, to engage all youth to want to participate going forward. And also, I think understand that heritage and understand what hunting is in Montana. To not lose that. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, you did a great job. Um, thank you about talking about how important the outdoors is to Montanans and then also to people coming to Montana. I'm wondering um, if you can talk about what role and, honestly, responsibility Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has in your mind towards uh, how federal lands are managed in our state. Oh, God. you saved the easy question for last. <laughs> so, I mean, first off, it's, it's not easy. It's a big shift for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for me to stand up here and talk about the outside is in us all. I would say that as an agency, we are not all there. It's not, you know, that's that's a new step. It makes total sense to me because that's what we're about and it is our responsibility. How that responsibility applies to federal land, um, that's a tricky jurisdictional question. Uh, you know, certainly wildlife management, um, and the health of rivers and aquatic species on, that go through those federal lands, we've got to pay attention to. We do, um, back to the Responsive Management Unit, any federal public land planning processes, we follow and we comment. And I specifically now ask, Wildlife, Fisheries, Parks, and Enforcement to comment. I want to hear from each of those divisions so that we're coordinating them. Um, so we have a role with federal public lands, but it's it's limited. You know, we would get we get pretty owly about the feds telling us what to do. <laughs> yeah, be careful about wanting to tell them what to do. But nonetheless, we absolutely 
have to, and I don't love it, I think it's part of, of, part of my job, I have to engage in those bigger national um, conversations about conservation and um, public land management. It's not always the most fun thing to do, but this is, I realized when I went to Norfolk, Virginia last week, I said to my staff who was upset, it's hard for me to be gone for a week, to be honest. And I said to them, if I don't show up at those conversations, the decisions are made for us. And Montana has something to say about this. And we have, I was talking about this earlier, I've, I feel very strongly that we have this window, this opportunity to lead out and to decide what future we want. There's a bit of a vacuum, for better or for worse, with not enough staff in federal agencies, with turnover. That leaves it, I think, for us. We have taken the lead in the past. Clearly, we've been leaders. But we can't rest on our laurels. I mean, it's really time for us to pay attention and lead the discussion. I think we are with grizzly bears. I think we are with sage grouse. I think we are on a number of issues, talking about habitat, not to specific species, um, on, on um, water, how important water is. I think a number of issues, we're, we're trying to, to lead that discussion. Mr. Gatsnow, I have a question from you tonight, and I see you're still there. I have I, I purposely planted people in the audience to turn to them to answer the hard questions for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for <laughs> Thank you, Margaret, so much for coming and spending time with us. We've got a nice little Trout You gift basket for you from your friends at MSU. And Hopefully you can wrap that in proudly when you go to Missoula. So uh, there might be a gross item or two in there. Um, thank you all for your time and attention and great thoughtful questions. We have a reception uh, just following now. So if you can uh, remain and continue to ask questions of uh, the experts in the room, I'm sure they'd love to hear them. So thank you.